What I did was I had a bunch of computer equipment from the early 70s and uh, wanted to donate it because it had a lot of software and stuff that was, I think, key to many other programs that became fairly famous in the future. And I to told both of the museums, the one back on the East Coast and the one over here on the West Coast, that I had this stuff and they said thanks but no thanks. So then you heard about the DigiBart online? And so I started looking around and I finally found some guy that uh, was fairly expert and a little bit of a historian. And he says, oh, well, you got to get a hold of Bruce Damer. And I go, I don't know who Bruce Damer is. And he says, well, look up DigiBart. And I was on the machine at that point on the internet. And so yeah. we're talking on the phone and I looked up DigiBart and I said, oh, that is great. <laughs> and I ended up calling Bruce and he said, oh, I would like all of that stuff. And so I brought all the stuff I had. And then when Bruce and I started talking, what uh, was real interesting is he goes, you really were in the 8008 before? And I go, yeah, we, we had a running system that had you know, programs up and running and working and attached to a hard disk and everything by 1973. So, so what exactly did you have working by 1973? Um, what we did was we got one of the, or actually two of the kits that Intel put out that were their 8008 chips, yeah. and it had a couple other parts with it, and they set that to the university because our university did a lot of work with the different computer firms. Mm -hmm. That was at a point in time where the universities were almost a brain trust. We did a lot of the mm -hmm. early development work for different things, and... I happened to be the guy that was in charge of the, the lab that did a lot of that. And uh, So you ran a lab at? Uh... Had a lab at Cal State University, Sacramento. Uh -huh. And I worked there from early 1972 until I finally retired in 99. Uh, and you were a professor, a teacher there? I taught there for years. I uh -huh. never got my doctorate, but I got a couple masters in software and hardware engineering. Uh -huh. And uh, what, 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 what were you? What kind of classes did you teach? What, uh... Well, my joke that I give most people is, is that I taught savages. Oh, nice and fair skin. Yeah, mostly, especially springtime when spring <laughs> fever was in. But no, yeah. I, I mostly taught uh, the digital engineering classes for the first probably eight or so years that I taught. But we had a big turnover in professors, and I ended up teaching software engineering as well. And it was kind of interesting. My first software class was the department chair grabbed me out of my office and said, come with me, and pulls me down the hall, he opens a big room full of students. He goes, class, this is Bill. Bill, this is class. Bill, you're teaching basic. <laughs> I, I go, oh, OK, I guess I'm teaching basic. <laughs> Which was kind of fun. Well, all the information was pretty new at the time, too, right? Yeah, it was. But so you were like just a, just a step ahead of the students, uh, some of the stuff? Um, no, they were usually ahead of me. <laughs> <laughs> I said, you guys can ask me questions, too. Yeah, I used to have a cartoon on the wall that had a big herd of Indians running away, and there's this chief behind them going, wait up, guys, I'm your leader. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that, that's kind of how I felt a lot of the time in that yeah. arena. Was it was it like project based? Did you did you get the kids to work on, on um, the lab? What I actually did was we had just started the department. It was started by Dr. John Miles, mm -hmm. and it only been in existence for two years and they weren't sure what we were going to do in that department. Mm -hmm. Remember this is an era where mainframes were king and hardware was king. Mm -hmm. Software really was an incidental that wor users worried about. So uh, basically where we were was we helped people with hardware. Yeah. And John Miles, his claim to fame. Hi. Hi, how are you doing? Doing well. Oh, Jerry. Jerry, Bill Pitts. Need, uh, oh, yeah. I saw some in there, Inside. but I don't know if we're supposed to use them oh. yet. Okay. We'll check with the fun. I'm, I'm Bill now. I'm Bill. Oh. Hi, Jerry. Co-founder of the museum with uh, Bruce. All right. Yeah. We're just getting a few stories. You want to pull up a chair? Oh, no. <laughs> well, me too. <laughs> you get to watch. Okay. Me too. Anyhow, the, the situation there was that we had a digital electronics lab and we were going to be producing computer scientists whose real goal in life was to be making digital equipment.
And it was really a change because electrical engineering mostly worked with discrete components and we worked with the digital components. And so my lab, which I actually ran, was the digital engineering lab. And so where, did, where did you, you know, when it was new information, this was before the internet, where did you get your information for this? For the, did you have to take classes yourself? Were there textbooks for this? Um, there? Mostly you rolled your own. <laughs> it was really a fly by the past. Oh, uh, it really was. With the 8008, we got, I think, five or six sheets, and they basically described the entri entire instruction set. That was all that was there. And then you had to decipher everything else yourself. Yeah, everything else you had to figure out, like, all of the timing was just a nightmare on that, and hooking it up to RAM was another interesting challenge. This was, I mean, this is like, the, the, still most people were into analog engineering, right? This, this yeah, we, we hadn't gone into, this is the early part of microprocessor development. Before the uh, single chip Before the single chip microprocessors. Mm -hmm. And what I did for the school was I was their firmware programmer, and I had written a program that allowed me to vet firmware before it was actually cast into silicon. So I ended up working for quite a few of the different firms. Uh, DEC, I helped with their PDP-11 as they converted it from um, discrete to digital electronics. And I modeled most of their units before they actually committed to putting them on silicon because that was pretty expensive. And so my, my program actually was away with a program to model whatever's there. I worked with Data General and I helped with the Data General 1200. Um, so the whole mini world was something you were familiar Yeah, with. and um, my big one was IBM. I converted the IBM System 3 from discrete to a pair of microprocessors. And it, Is that what you were talking about earlier with the uh, 8008? Yeah, so the 8008 you could look at is just basically the same simple processor that's hidden inside a microprocessor and then that microprocessor is actually run by a set of firmware to give it its enhanced instructions. Mm -hmm. So what I used to do was I programmed those enhanced instructions. I would be the guy that would actually write the machine in a way that it could understand the assembler binary. Mm -hmm. Call that firmware. And yeah, so close to machine language, right? Just, uh, uh, well, it's one level below yeah. machine language. It's what you write to get machine language to work. Oh, I see. So the, the subterranean work. Yeah, it's kind of hidden underneath. Hardware. It's in the hardware, and they usually burn it into the microprocessor chip itself. Wow. So anyhow, I had been doing that, and it wasn't to me a real challenge to take a program I already had written mm -hmm. and convert it over so that it would turn the 8008 on IBM's basic assembler language, BAL code. Yeah, and so that allowed you to port a whole bunch of stuff. Oh yeah, and you know, we had... Many to the micro world. Okay. Not just many, even host and world. And the, the uh, same. Yeah, and uh, in fact, that's how I had to port, was all of our students used the Cyber 3150, but that was one of those where you gotta buy the lowest cost because of the way the state purchased things. Mm. So most of our students ran an emulator which ran BAL. So they actually wrote BAL decks for their interpreter class, their compiler class, their operating system class, basic um, database class. They each had to, they had to do one of these in each of these different classes. Hmm. And yeah, you also like pretty uh, important thing to know. So what was the, what that was the like? IBM basic assembly. Basic assembly language, language. yeah. Okay. So once you know that, then you, you could that you would, could get employed right. <laughs> as a software engineer, right? Yeah, developing the microcomputer revolution, was, which was yet to come. Yeah. So anyhow, once I had BAL, it was a piece of cake because we had such a big cheating problem that we collected all of the outputs and all of the decks and kept them, which were all in cards, you know, 80 column cut punch cards. So when I wanted a DOS, I went looking for a student that looked like they really had their act together, that got an A on their paper, which I could see, and I grabbed their, their tech and shoved it in, and with a little bit of tweaking, I actually had had DOS up and running, you know, with very little pain and suffering. I liked your outfit. <laughs> That's Bruce and his finest today. <laughs> Great, thank you. Yeah, transformation Superman, right? Okay. So he, he's, he's uh, 
So the artifacts, um, did these, these are from those times? Or that was, uh, are they um, they're a piece of it. What actually we did was we got the 8008s, yeah. and when I moved into that job, there wasn't anybody there before. So these things were in a nice sealed box, two boxes, and they were sitting there locked away in our special little cabinet of do not touch things. And I go, well, what the heck are these? And one of the professors says, well, we got these from a chip maker. They make memory chips, and they've started making this processor, and they didn't know what to do with it. Huh. So they sent a bunch of them out to the university to see if we could do anything with it. See if we can create a market for it. Yeah, or to play with it or whatever. Yeah. So one of my students and I, a guy by the name of uh, Alan Newman, Mm -hmm. took me a while to remember his name, Bruce asked me before, got a digi designer, which was a breadboarding board, and you could plug the chip into the middle and then put support chips, and then you ran wires all over the place, and so it had a little power lamp supply. Lamp. And yeah, we, in theory, we're gonna make something that would flash lights that we could program and all that sort of thing. In practice, we learned all about microprocessors. They were so bloody fast that our best scope that we had on campus couldn't trigger or track because we used nothing but analog at that point. So we had no way to understand what the digital was doing or how it behaved or whatever. So it was witchcraft for the early ones trying to get them to work. And finally, uh, our head tech by the name of Russell Light, uh -huh. he uh, took our kludge design and built us a really nice actual printed circuit which his partner David Mack uh, built for us and so we actually had a hard built you know oh, PC nice board came out the first oh time. yeah it was yeah. heaven compared to this wire wrap mess that we started with huh. in fact I went to one of the West Coast computer shows years later and a guy by the name of Steve Jobs was sitting there on a peach box with the same kind of wire wrap that we had, you know, six years before. Yeah, we really did. In fact, my partner ended up helping him out a little bit. Uh, oh, really? John Katowski did early the, Apple. he actually did the artwork for the motherboard for the early Apple II. John Katowski, in spite of what some of the stories say. <laughs> Under the board stories. Yeah. Wiring under the board, literally. Literally. But anyhow, the, the story on this 8008 8, is that we went from wire wrap fairly soon to a really nice little motherboard that worked. And we had a lot of problems with power supplies because the power supplies were all analog mm. and they had plus or minus 10 or 15 percent. And we literally had to go to different capacitors and resistors and a whole different set of diodes and stuff. Did you switching power supply then those days? No, we didn't even know what that was then. <laughs> Anyhow, we uh, finally got the thing up and going, but it still was fairly unreliable, and I had a firm by the name of Tektronix, which was famous for their scopes, yeah, but they yeah, also absolutely. made Storage scopes and graphic and terminals, and really high. And all kinds yeah. Of yeah. Did you worked with them? Well, I had um, helped John Miles do the firmware for their um, graphics displays. Wow. And they wanted me, so they wooed me by paying my way up to go see him there in Oregon. And uh, This was uh, bef uh, after uh, your, your days as, uh, in the lab? No, I was still in the lab. This would have been really early 73, oh, so I think. parallel. Yeah, it? parallel. Okay. And, uh, Anyhow, I went up and I interviewed, and it turned out that I didn't talk the right language. I wasn't formally trained. I trained myself, and I didn't know what all of the different words and terms were that they were talking. You know, inverse police notation, what do you mean by that? Eventually, you know, I got my degrees, and I could actually teach that, but, <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I started off as a ham radio operator like so many other people, and my electronics went on to help put together a radio station where I was a disc jockey. <laughs> Captain Midnight, right? Yeah. And, and what was your uh, ham radio sign? Um, goofy Bill. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking like W3GT. No, no, no. Goofy Bill. That was me. And I had a strange radio. What I did was I took an aircraft radio and I modified it. It was a King. ADF, which was an automatic direction finder. So for my radio, I had a loop antenna that I could 
spin around to make sure I was getting the signal headed in the right direction. Which is kind of fun. Anyhow, I, I uh, played around with this 8008 Tektronix, took pity on me, and they made me a solid 8008 based system. Um, and they gave it to me. And uh, that was really neat. Oh, they gave us the works. It, officially, they gave it all to the school. They gave the school the monitor and so forth, and then I ended up getting all the parts being given to me for my help that I had given them on some of their projects. So this was like really one of the first microcomputer systems then? Um, in 8008? I think that there were parallel operations going on by CTS, which eventually became what, DataPoint? Huh. Um, there were a number of firms already playing with this in 72. Uh, and I'm not sure they knew what they were doing or what they wanted to do with it, but there were a lot of people working on these things at that point. This wasn't uh, brand new. Anyhow. You ran BAL on it. I, I well, yeah, I don't think many of them did that. Right, so I gave it instant functionality. Yeah, and that made a lot of people jealous because yeah. we could say, well, well, ours works. Yeah. But what I didn't tell people was that ours only had <clears throat> 4K of PROM and 4K of RAM, which was bragging rights back then, but it was too small to run anything but the most simple programs. Not much on the mini computers. Or the no. Right. And what were they, just for comparison? What would you have on a decent mini? Well, mini we had just gone to solid state RAM. Did you? Uh, the world had. And so solid state RAM was, what were they? They were 2102 chips, if I remember right, which was not a whole bunch of information. I mean, like, uh, like 8K or something like that, or uh, oh no, well, 256, 256 bytes. 256 bytes, yeah. yeah. 260, not even K. Not even K, and uh, they had timing issues and a bunch of other things. But Intel was one of the major makers of those, so with their RAM and their RAM controller hooked to this micro, we solved most of those timing problems, which was kind of neat. And then, uh, anyhow, once Intel and the Tektronix things came together. We had a working system almost immediately and we put it into use, which was kind of fun. We, were, we never started off to play microcomputer games. What we were trying to do was build a small medical business computer that would be affordable for a regular medical office that a doctor could maintain his records on. Yeah, that would be one of the first major applications that makes sense. And, uh, we Software actually, that would be a bitch for that, I mean, with all the codes and everything. Oh, it was a lot of fun, but uh, <laughs> we actually got the thing up and running yeah. and functional. We were using the uh, mainframe for the big analysis because we just didn't have enough RAM to, to write a very significant program. But for the small stuff, we had a, a lot of fun. We ended up writing a nutritional program that tracked everything that you ate or drank for a full week and then spit that back out in calories. and. All your different vitamins and mineral components, and a few of the amino acids, even, which was kind of fun. That actually took off. That ended up creating a number of different firms, which was kind of fun. Yeah. You may have heard of a few of them Nutralab. Neutralab? Nutra and Neutra UTR. Lab. I have. Yeah, that was one of the firms that used our software. In fact, I got hired by Neutralabs to buy, build their software. And I also did the software eventually for, you'll love this, American Diabetic Association. Oh, wow. And right also, uh, yeah, uh, Nutrisystems. I helped build their software so they could build diets for the food that they shipped out, which was kind of fun. But anyhow, that was all spin-offs of this 8008 work that we started early. And, Is this uh, um, 8008 artifact from the Tektronix days? Is that yeah, it's here. Oh, that's, that's the one? That's the one that's here. And it's kind of fun because you can look at that and it shows you a tape interface, um, teletype interface, a full-blown modem that goes up to 9600 baud. Wow. Okay, this is 1973 technology. You were lucky you didn't have 300 baud, you know? <laughs> oh, well, most people didn't. Everybody was doing, you know, the 120, 12 characters a second. But um, the memory that's on there is just beautiful. It's lined up. It shows exactly how to build it and all that. The extension boards on there predated all of the extension boards. 
plus each channel had its own LEDs and some switches so you could play games and track how the thing worked. But this wasn't hobby. This was professional gear that we were trying to get to the point where we could turn it into a, a viable medical system that would go. And we actually, in 76, we went to Washington, D.C. and presented this whole system to the FDA. And uh, the two doctors that were the heads of it were um, Gary Gordon and his brother, and I've forgotten his brother's name, obviously Gordon, but uh, they were the two heads and we presented it with them. FDA gave us nice plaques and attaboys and go for it and, go for it. and all kinds of businesses spun off of that. Uh, computer and medicine businesses, which was was great stuff. Yeah, that was a pretty seminal days for medical. There was just a lot of disparate databases yeah. everywhere and they uh, needed to be I actually got pulled in by uh, Kaiser Permanente, and they used a lot of our databases for their multi-phasic program, which they put in place shortly after that on their mainframe, which was one of the first efforts to actually track people's health and see if the computer could help in terms of identifying problems before they became severe, which was kind of neat. Preventative medicine. That's basically what we were working on. And we had a lot of things going that were almost a cult at that point because we were doing thermography. And thermography hadn't even been heard of in most of the, the country. So when you're saying we, is this back at the... Uh, the, yeah, the this is in the 72, 73 range. Okay. And yeah, there was a machine that was out of Europe. I've forgotten what the name of it was, but it did thermographs. And we'd actually take those and do a, an analysis on the the thermographs to see if there are any hot areas because the hot areas indicate either infection or cancer, which is yeah. kind of interesting stuff. Thermographic uh, medicine. Uh, yeah. For sure. But, you know, it was such strange technology that you had to have liquid nitrogen, you know, and it was, it, it was pretty intense kind of stuff. We even had a hyperbaric chamber, which yeah. was kind of fun. Play with the... Uh, Carillion photography at the time? No, I didn't. I didn't go that occult. <laughs> well, that's high voltage. It's yeah, I know. <laughs> you can make it look like anything you want if you change the voltage, right? But we won't go there. Yeah. Okay. Well, thermography though was, it had a lot of potential. You know, experience. Yeah. Anyhow, we yeah. we played with a lot of that stuff. I ended up in a position where many different firms came looking for different kinds of help. One of those firms was Intel, and we had shared with Intel in trade for more toys everything that we had done. And actually, they came up with a little system, and I've got the books and stuff for that that I, I brought with us that was based almost exactly on the system that we had, except it fit in a real box where ours was kind of spread all over the place. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And... Uh, Intel came back a second time a few years later and they asked me if I'd help them with the instruction set, which I thought was kind of nice. And So you did, right? I did. Yeah, I, I added a few things that I thought really needed to be there. I had to put most of those things in using firmware, but it would, it would have been nice if they were just, you know, part of the resident mm -hmm. package. So that, that was the next level of uh... And the problem with the firmware is that it added a whole nother layer of slow. And the chip was slow to start with, so they put slow firmware there. And even though you can run everything in the world, you've got to have a lot of patience for things to happen. Isn't that where you try to try to get the firmware into hardware? I mean, uh, at some point? Yeah. yeah. And in fact, it's funny because yesterday I went to Fry's. Yeah. And they showed me a new toy. And it just blew my mind because it's exactly the same toy that we got in there. But it's now 2008, and the toy in there was 1971. And what they have finally done on the ASUS boards, the new motherboards, is they put a flash memory chip, an 8 gig. So what you do is you load your full operating system into the flash memory, and as soon as you turn it on, you're instantly into Windows and ready to fly. You don't have to wait for the hard disk to spin up and all of the checks and all of this what you do. Yeah, I mean, considering how cheap it is these days. Oh, yeah. And in fact, if you want, there's two chip holes on the board, mm -hmm. and you can add additional all the way on up to another 64 gig. <laughs> 200 bucks. Sweet. Yeah. But anyhow, 
what that does is that gives you an instant on. Well, we did exactly the same thing with that. In there, we had 1702 prompts that you programmed, and to erase them, you have to use a UV light. I'll show you the UV light. I brought it over here for Bruce to ask people about. Anyhow, that, yeah, that's how the programming works, right? Yeah. Fascinating process. It's almost photographic. Huh? Pretty crazy. <laughs> Anyhow, we had a lot of fun with that. We hooked it up to a uh, surplus SCSI drive that we had. And uh, it was a three fix, two removable. And it was megabytes. Oh, wow. <laughs> and yeah. you know, we're talking sizable platters, actually. I think it was a 14 inch. Oh, so those were like uh, ones for mainframe? Yeah, well, they mainframe? were the mini. They were the, the SCSI mini. mini. The SCSI Almost mini. all of them were made Software by this. Decks and data generals and stuff like Almost that. all of them used the same hardware uh -huh. for their peripherals. They just put their names so on it. So you started them. grabbing uh, mini peripherals. And that was really nice because what Tektronix had done is they provided us the serial, the parallels, the teletype, and then the SCSI interfaces. All protocols for those interfaces. And we had the protocols and the hardware. So wow. all it was a matter of doing was just hooking up the DOS to the appropriate hunk of code and put it in and away we went. We had, the, we went. Program, right? we had yeah. the blueprint for it. So, you know, I didn't create BASIC in two days like some people seem to claim. In fact, our basic took me probably four months, and I started with a working program from a student. Now, for the uninitiated, there were many flavors of basic coming out around that oh, yeah. time, and right? everyone and their sister were designing some flavor that was good. Some flavor that was good. Yeah. Almost all of them were identical, though, from the vantage that they used integer arithmetic. They didn't have floating point. Yeah, that floating. I remember that Apple went through that. And the big difference between them was how they did I.O., because I.O. was real ugly. For those who had sophisticated equipment and used interrupt-based I.O., where it waves a flag when it's got something that's coming in. Or, they or, use floating points? Well, what they did was they did polling. And that would be like me just sitting here continually asking you if you're ready for me now? Are you ready for me now? And that's all your computer did was it went into an I.O. loop and it just sat there and it spun waiting for something to happen. And when it did, it knew what to do. And then it knew what to do. So it yeah. was, you know, asking that question, you know, thousands of times a second, but it was doing nothing else in the meanwhile. And that's why it's so nice that we now have multi-user, multi-function operating systems today, because that horsepower, 99% of what a computer did was these I.O. pollings. But if you had good equipment, like some of the stuff that we got from Tektronix, it was interrupt based and so all you had to do was you had a flag and the flag come up and that would go ahead and trigger you off to another place and you, then you could come back to wherever you were which was kind of neat but that was the main difference between the basics was whether or not they had the different types of IOs and then the other thing would be how elegant they would allow both the math and the output with some you could get real elegant for instance, most of the mainframe basics had printer control, new page, new line, skip a line, all of those kind of things. The stuff that came out for the early uh, mini computers didn't have that at all. You, you spit it 81 characters and the 81st character goes on to line number two. <laughs> Automatic, the hardware had that problem. So this is where the uh, micros started to evolve beyond their predecessors, I guess. Yeah, well, again, all the early micros were where they were mini computers. Yeah, because that's where the they were, got in. Yeah, they were literally mini computers, and what we did was wrote the firmware it allows you to, connect to, them. to turn it into a micro. Now, at that point in time, the electronics industry landed on its nose real hard. Like a recession or something? Oh, it just almost wiped it out, because what happened was the technology... Are you doing okay? Yeah, I'm just gonna make this and get my voice as well. Okay. What happened with that technology is real scary because we had a whole genre of uh, engineers, electrical engineers, and they were all busy building printed circuit cards. And a printed circuit card kind of the rule of thumb was it was cost a hundred thousand dollars took one man years worth of work to get it up and going and working what the microprocessor did is it gave you a standard card 
with a little bit of read-only memory on it, and you wrote a program for that read-only memory to give you whatever digital function you wanted out of that card. And you could do that in four hours. So here you had an As opposed to a, a man year? A man year, yeah. Wow. That was found. And it wiped out the electronics industry overnight. Wow. The big firms that didn't move, unless they were into heavy iron like GE, where they're making a lot of motors and stuff, anybody that was into discrete circuits either died instantly or they moved over quickly and they got into the microprocessor based technology because it was just so much faster to design. Plus, you could take that ROM, throw it away, and plug in a new one and have an upgraded machine when you came out with more, better, faster software. Right, right. <laughs> the uh, eternal path of the eternal upgrade had its birth. Yeah, it's funny because it's exactly the same thing that happened in the software world. The software world was an afterthought where customers were responsible for their own. My bragging rights were, you know, did I have a 15-speed shift and, you know, a 4,000-mile-an-hour car? It was all hardware. Everybody bragged about their hardware and how many MIPS it would do. It wouldn't do any real work, but, boy, it really ran fast. <laughs> okay? It did that I.O. loop faster than anybody, <laughs> which I thought was kind of cute. Well, you're out with the hardware. Hey, I started off as a hardware engineer. <laughs> Actually, I majored in biomedical engineering. I was first class of biomedical engineers for UC Davis. Really? Yeah. So you were thinking of medical applications from an early age then? Yeah. In fact, I built a bunch of uh, hospital patient monitors and things like that when I was at Davis and got quite a reputation as uh, a go-to guy when you wanted to design or build something new, which is fun. Actually, creating the, uh, the prototypes and stuff. Okay. But back to the thought on Bill Gates. Yeah. Where we were was software was traded freely and it had no real value. Are we working? Yeah, I'm just putting in the remote. Okay. Um, we had no real value on software, even though it took you know countless hours to write and get correct. Mm -hmm. um, it was freely traded by IBM because IBM basically had at least one if not two or more full-time engineers at each computer site and their job was to keep each computer running while their other job was to snitch any software that looked kind of interesting and they'd put it out in their network and that's how software spread was the IBM software engineers spread it to all of their other potential customers if it looked like it was going to have value. For instance, that main calc program that I brought in, I had somebody call me from Dade County, Florida, asking me if I could do, you know, a change to make it work for them with the way that they wanted to do business, which was kind of fun, and I never sent them a copy. <laughs> well, how did, how did they get it? Did they have, like, an, an early network? Yeah, IBM actually had a library of available online programs. Or was it, uh, was it a, a accessible? Uh, they didn't have online back then. It was a oh, I know. So I was wondering book, <laughs> piece of paper, <laughs> a book. Well, I see. They publish a book that then was distributed. Yes. Who... <laughs> no, you, they're software engineers only. And then if you were nice, you went and talked to their software engineers and they'd look in their magic book and they'd go, oh yeah, in University of New Hampshire, they've got one of these. I see. So and it was a really coveted uh, piece of yeah, it was, information at the time. and IBM controlled that very tightly. Yeah, because it was their... Uh, it was uh, part of their special offerings to make their systems, which cost lots more, more effective for customers. Mm -hmm. So you buy IBM, you buy their, their service and support. Service support and their software, software distribution type stuff, which was kind of fun. Nice. But anyhow, what Bill Gates did was... And again, like I say, I think he started just like everybody else, you know, with the basics that he borrowed, and then he uh, added to. But what he really did was he, unlike all of the other people in this industry, he took the money that they earned and put it back into more software engineers and making a better and better product. And it finally got to the point that the only competitor he had, which was IBM, gave up and said, Microsoft owns the software market. We can't spend enough money to catch them at this point. They uh, have, was that when they 
offered uh, That's, Bill the, the opportunity to make the IBM personal computer? No, that was after that. It, it, Bill Gates basically did that in that period from 70, what, 5? To about 85, 86 is when he developed yeah, remember this. Remember the person who was about 82? Yeah, I think 82. And that was, uh, that's, he was well established in Washington then. It was quite yeah. well, a I think big shot in the industry. I spent a day with him. Did you? <laughs> that's great. I remember that. Uh, interesting. Oh, so, did you. Um, did you uh, uh, stay at the the, uh, the college through the 70s then? Yeah, I, I taught until 1999 there. So oh, yeah, I, really? Okay, so you were really a career teacher. Uh, well, not really. I, I got drafted by the governor because he found out that I was doing magic with computers over at the university uh -huh. through a friend of a friend, and the next thing you know, I'm writing programs like MainCalc to solve problems for the state of California, so. Really, the governor heard about you? Oh yeah, it was, a, it was kind of fun. I met Jerry Brown and wow. it was even more fun when the poor guy got, you know, unelected and George Dugmation came in and everybody had to submit their resignations if we were appointed, which I was, and they looked at my um, resignation and my resume and they go, how were you working for Jerry Brown? You're a Republican. I said, he never asked me. <laughs> <laughs> so I ended up doing the same job for uh, Duke Mason, which was a lot of fun. <laughs> That's funny, you're a Republican working for Governor Moonbeam. He didn't, he never asked me. He just asked me if I could make it work. And I said, That's yes, and That's I, great. That's I had a lot of interest. He had a pragmatic side to his mind then. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Did you work, work in, what, in Sacramento then? I worked in Sacramento, yeah. yeah. I worked for a number of different departments. Uh -huh. You've got me to thank for having to get your car smogged every two years. Oh, really? Yeah, I actually was the one that invented and invent is a bad word because what I did was I took a standard CO2 infrared platform and I tied it up to a standard AT computer, IBM AT, and I put some security into it with a program and that basically started our, our smog check program. Did you create the software that the gas stations had to use in order to... Pretty the much. Data? Well, I, I oversaw it. Yeah. But so they stick a little thing in the tailpipe? And yeah, in fact, one of the problems that I cured was them sticking it into the tailpipe on car B when you're testing car A. Oh. <laughs> right, they quickly figured out how to play the system. Yeah, yeah, which was kind of fun. But yeah. yeah, for a while there, I was sure somebody was going to do me in. Ford Motor Company, I'm sure, had a contract on me at one point or another. They had the most failures? They had the most problems. Wow. And we finally ended up compromising and letting their cars go for two years if they promised to clean them up in two years, which was kind of a fun thing. Think about their techies too, I guess. Yeah, but anyhow, I, I got involved in all kinds of things with the state of California. Everything from writing their standards to how to do security. Yeah. <laughs> it's a big topic. Oh, they are kind of fun. Yeah. But, uh, wow. I was kind of good at nothing, but knew a lot about everything. <laughs> what they call it, a comprehensive generalist. Yeah, if even that. <laughs> it's kind of fun. But yeah, I, it was an interesting thing because I did uh, everything from hardware to software to managing, you know, teams of people, wow. which was, kept me more than busy. How did, how did you uh, handle retirement? Uh, it's um, been a big shift for you. Actually, that was one of the things that led me to Bruce was that my health took a real dive in 2000. I was doing some woodworking with some real toxic wood and ended up having a nasty reaction to it and almost passed away at that point. And uh, I worked part-time. They really didn't want me to retire for another four years. And finally my doctor and my boss got together and said, we're gonna put you out to pasture. And I had been, believe it or not, because of my state service with UC Davis and Sac State and then with the state so many years that I had 37 years, so they gave me a retirement, which was kind of nice. And I started looking for to downsize my big home and all this sort of thing and started getting rid of stuff and go, oh, this is too good to throw away. I had four cabinets, file cabinet drawers full of the early software 
everything from V-Edit, which was combined with um, Don Tarbell's. Pa so you were practically your own museum. Yeah, in, mostly in paper because I, you know, I didn't keep the hardware. Yeah. But V-Edit was combined with uh, Don Tarbell's software to create uh, electric pencil. I remember the first CPM uh, word processors I ever saw. Was well, actually, I think it, it ran native. Really? Uh, it, it didn't even have to have CPM. You didn't need to. Wow. Yeah, it was just like their basic, like Microsoft Basic. Wow. Ran native, like the Don Tarbell software. <laughs> it's pretty ugly stuff. You want to go inside? Yes, let's take a look.